Z-Wave JS UI is a control panel that lets you control all of your Z-Wave devices. It allows you to apply firmware updates, create groups, and it also even supports MQTT. It has automatic backups of your settings and some other really cool diagnostic tools. So in this video, I'm gonna go through the difference between Z-Wave JS and Z-Wave JS UI. We're then gonna go through some installation steps with a Home Assistant add-on. I'm gonna show you all the configuration options and then I'll show you how to include a device on your Z-Wave network. So let's take a look. So what is the difference between Z-Wave JS and Z-Wave JS UI? So Z-Wave JS is the controller software that talks to your Z-Wave controller device and then it allows it to send commands to all of the devices in your smart home. The Z-Wave JS UI is just the user interface that you click on to interact with Z-Wave JS. So as you can see here, the Home Assistant add-on includes both of these all in one. So you don't need to install different things in order to get it working. You just interact with the UI and the UI communicates with Z-Wave JS and takes care of the rest. But you know what? Most people don't really care about how it works. So let's just get in there and start to configure it. But basically what you'll do is you'll go over to settings and you'll go over to add-ons and you'll go down here to add-on store. You'll then search for Z-Wave JS UI and then you'll click this one. You'll then click install. So once you've rebooted your system, let's go ahead and do Z-Wave JS. You might get an error that says fail to open. That's totally fine. We need to configure a few things first. If we go under the UI, it's just controls light mode. Oh, that's so bright. Or let's, oh, thank goodness. Let's change that back to dark mode. There you go. You can also use tabs instead of this sidebar. You can click that to create a tabbed view. Doing tutorials on a real system and you don't want to leak your information, you would click streamer mode and it would hide all that. This is a brand new test system I've got here. So I'm going to leave that disabled. So collapse this one and then open up general. Here's where you can set a password for Z-Wave JS UI specifically. This is different than your home assistant password, but uh, you can set it here if you want. Quite honestly, I never use this. Uh, I pretty much keep this disabled and only access Z-Wave JS through Home Assistant. If you were hosting it standalone, I would recommend enabling this. So next is uh, Z-Wave JS plugins. Quite honestly, I've never used these plugins. Uh, they've got some Prometheus exporting for um, for logging metrics and that sort of thing. If you want to send your logs to Prometheus, this is where you probably do it. And quite honestly, until I was making this video, I didn't even know they existed. So. Make sure the logging is enabled. Uh, we can change the info level. If you want to save it to a file, then you'll enable this. Generally speaking, I don't save to a file because over time that file can grow and it can take up storage space on your Home Assistant server. If you aren't interested in seeing the different things that change from different releases, you can go ahead and make sure this disable change logs box is checked. We have automatic updates enabled in the extension, so we can leave this unchecked. Okay, so these two sections you'll probably never use, but just in case, uh, there's two sections here under general. There's device values and then scheduled jobs. Device values allows you to apply certain settings to similar devices on your network. So for example, if you had a bunch of smart switches and they all had, and they all had an LED on the front and you wanted to change the color of that LED, you could do something like that here. I've never needed to do that. I usually leave it to the defaults for all my devices. So if you really wanted to get in here and screw around, you could. Uh, you can click new value and then you would select which device or which device category you want to do. I have a bunch of devices here. And once you choose your device, you can actually select what value you want to either parse or receive. Uh, so I'm going to cancel out of that. Now for scheduled jobs, you can run certain things at specific times and uh, they will run continuously based on when you want. So we could rescan for nodes if we wanted to, you know, we could uh, rescan for nodes. And so you can add a cron string here if you really wanted to change the frequency, like if you wanted to run every hour or every minute. CronTab.Guru is, is a great reference for different cron strings. Uh, but quite honestly, I've never needed to run any jobs on my Z-Wave network. They include some basic uh, snippets here. So like you can ping all your nodes or re-interview them all on a certain schedule, but the nodes contact your controller anyway. So there's, there's no real point in my opinion for anyone to do this, but you could do it if you wanted to. Okay, so if we move on to the backup, 
window. This is where we can control uh, some of our backups and settings for uh, Z-Wave JS UI. So, and so if these are disabled, go ahead and enable them. Uh, this will back up some of the Z-Wave JS UI settings over here in the store. So go ahead and click backup, and then uh, you can select how many you want. I've said seven, uh, just in case. And then um, you can back these up every hour, or you can change the string to however you want for once a day or whatever. So you can go ahead and use crontab.guru if you want to change the frequency, where it'll keep overriding the oldest backup as newer backups occur. The controller backups here are what back up your Z-Wave network uh, settings. And so I have that enabled here with also a max of seven. If you wanted to, you could back up your settings. So every time you add, remove, or replace a Z-Wave device in your network, when this is enabled, it'll then create a backup. So I'd go ahead and enable this. So once these look good, we can go to the Z-Wave menu. And here's where you can choose your Z-Wave controller device. I've already got mine selected right here, but you might see some other stuff. You can leave the directory alone. This just shows where to store all your configuration. These are the security keys for your Z-Wave network. These are big long strings of random characters that let your devices and your controller communicate securely with each other. So go ahead and generate some of these by using the little rotating arrow keys. Now for these radio configuration settings, you generally want to leave these alone. The controller knows what its default power level is and it will stick with that. Okay, so for these four here, these log the internal Z-Wave JS um, messages and uh, network traffic and that sort of thing, just like the other logs for or the UI and other logging earlier. You can go ahead and you can enable them if you want, but don't log to a file. You can just keep some of these. You'll probably never check these driver logs quite honestly unless something goes disastrously wrong. So we'll just enable the capture of them, but we're not gonna save them off anywhere. So in here, you can control the startup and recovery behavior. Generally speaking, uh, you'll want the soft reset and controller recovery checked and then uh, bootloader disabled. Basically, if you change certain things, you might need to do a soft reset, which just reboots the service, but not necessarily like the entire network or all the nodes. Uh, and so um, if you have older uh, sticks or if you have certain Z-Wave ones, uh, you might need to disable this. There, There is one interesting checkbox here, which is this watchdog. And so if you have a 700 series or 700 series and newer chips have a watchdog that will, uh, you know, restart the chip if for some reason it goes haywire. We want to enable this. So make sure this one's checked for controller recovery, response timeout, and this increase report timeout. You can leave those as the default. And then down here, you can enable the statistics. If you want to send anonymous usage data, I generally disable that. But if you want to help out the project, you can go ahead and enable that. Preferred scales is an interesting one. So you'll see here that it will say different types of temperature or humidity. And so most of the common ones will be temperature and humidity. There are many other options here if you really wanted to. So I would only set these if your device was reporting a sensor's value inaccurately. And so Z-Wave JS UI technically includes the Z sniffer, which is a Z-Wave wireless communication analyzer that lets you look at the messages that are sent between all the devices on your Z-Wave network. Most people should never need to do this. Okay, so with these last two configuration options, you got the MQTT gateway and also the Home Assistant settings. So we're gonna look at Home Assistant first. We wanna make sure that WS Server, which stands for WebSockets, make sure this is enabled. This allows Home Assistant to talk to Z-Wave JS and receive instant updates whenever entities change. You can pretty much keep these settings at the default values. Make sure DNS discovery is checked that will let Home Assistant automatically detect the add-on's host name here. If it doesn't for some reason, you can then copy this in. If you want to use MQTT, then you can go ahead and enable this MQTT gateway box. We can expand the top level menu and this is just a user-friendly name that identifies where your MQTT server is. This is the address. So in this case, I have a Home Assistant virtual machine out there along with the ports and um, how long to reconnect and retaining messages. This is the MQTT prefix that ZWHS UI uses when it sends messages. You can leave this alone, but if, if you really wanted to, you could change the Z-Wave prefix and then all of your messages would end up saying Z-Wave 
dash test for them, and then you would have the regular message after that. You'll enter the MQTT username and password. Now down here under Gateway, there's a few different settings you can look at if you're really interested in the nitty gritty. But generally speaking, you can leave these alone. They allow you to change what type of things are sent it's sent to MQTT, so you can change whether you want literally the entire object or just some time and a value or the value. And you can toggle all these different things here. So like if you want to include the node's name whenever a message is sent, then go ahead and check that. Or you can just send everything if you wanted to on a specific topic. So I usually disable that. And if you wanted more details with your MQTT message, you can enable this one. But uh, usually the defaults are fine, but if you want to come in here and toggle some different options, you certainly can. So go ahead and save that one if you made any changes. And you've made sure to set your serial port correctly to whatever your Z-Wave controllers. Make sure you reboot Home Assistant. That is so important. If you don't reboot, it may or may not show up and you might be left wondering what's going on. So always make sure to reboot when you change any of the serial port options. So once you reboot, you should be able to see your controller listed here at the top. You can expand it by clicking on the, the drop down arrow and here you can kind of change some of the different uh, aspects of it if you really want to leave these alone generally speaking. If you want to control different aspects of the entire network or the controller itself, you can go down here to the hamburger icon and click on that and go up to advanced actions. This shows all the actions that are, you know, network wide, like you can rebuild how each node recognizes the other nodes, or you can just factory reset everything if you wanted to. Generally, you won't need to go in here. Maybe occasionally you'll need to update the firmware, but for the most part, you won't need to really bother in here because you'll have automatic backups if you set the configuration earlier. So you can pretty much leave most of these alone. Um, what we will do is go back down to the hamburger icon and you can click manage nodes. This is what lets you include, exclude, or replace a device on your network. So make sure you check inclusion and we'll give it a name here. Uh, we'll say guest bedroom door or, you know, wherever you're going to put this device, wherever it'll be physically located. You can leave the location blank. This will only be stored in Z-Wave JS. It won't be stored in Home Assistant, which is where I usually manage all my devices. So go ahead and leave that blank. We'll click next. If your device has security, uh, which I would highly recommend, uh, I would check this box. I usually just keep it as defaults. That way, if, it has, if the device has security, it'll be added with security. If it doesn't, then it'll just add it uh, without it. Now, scan QR code is an interesting option here for the inclusion mode. It is only for newer devices that support S2 security. And kind of the only thing obviously is that it requires that, it, you know, be on your phone. If you have the Home Assistant app, you can do it, but it also requires using HTTPS in order for, for this to work. When you're dealing with security, you generally want it to be secure. I don't have that set up because it's only available on my home network. I don't expose it to the internet, so I can't really use this one. But um, if you have a picture of a device's QR code, you can import it here. You can also select this text. You get a QR code scanner app on your phone and you can just point it at the Z-Wave QR code that's there on um, any new device. I have mine censored because there's device specific information, but basically you'll scan that little QR code and it'll give you back a big long character string. You then copy and paste that string into the app when it prompts you for the text and you'll be able to add the device that way. Click next. Inclusion mode is started. Now I have a door sensor here. Make sure you check your manufacturer's documentation uh, for how to include or add devices to a network. So I'm gonna triple tap the back of my device. And it added the door sensor. This door sensor doesn't have any security apparently, so it just said nothing. But if yours does, it will mention what security method it was added with. So just a heads up. Okay, so let's close that box. And you can see it added here with the manufacturer, the product and then code, and then the uh, the name that we gave it earlier, along with various other settings. Z-Wave JS and Z-Wave JS UI are two great pieces of software that every smart home user should have in their setup. Huge shout out to the project authors for all the work that they do. I'm going to link to their projects in the description. I've donated to their project in the past and I would encourage you to do the same. It has provided so much value and they give it away for free. It's incredible. Now a great Z-Wave controller is the Zoos ZST-39. 
I've got a review of that. I'll put it here in the video cards and also put it in the description. That's the one that I use on a regular basis. I also show the two simple ways that Z-Wave devices can be updated through Home Assistant and Z-Wave JS. Check out that video over here and I'll see you over there.